Well, good morning, Greenwich. Today is Monday. It's July 27th. It was so good to uh, be with many last night at our uh, second outdoor Vespers gathering. Uh, the weather cooperated uh, with us this week. A great time of song and prayer and reflection upon God's Word. Uh, as we begin uh, another week together, uh, sharing a psalm and continuing with our theology series. I hope that uh, this day and this coming week will be encouraging to you to help develop and build faith, hope, and love, and that this will be part of our seeking after God as if hidden treasure, uh, that buried treasure that we were speaking about yesterday morning. Let me go ahead and uh, get on into our morning psalm. It's Psalm 57. This is... Uh, a psalm of David says, When he had fled from Saul into the cave, and it's to the tune of Do Not Destroy. It's for the director of music, so this was uh, intended to be sung. Have mercy on me, O God, have mercy on me, for in you my soul takes refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God Most High, to God who fulfills His purpose for me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends His love and His faithfulness. I am in the midst of lions. I lie among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Psalm 87. And so, obviously, there's that concern. So, the heading tells us very specifically David wrote this out of the context of that time when King Saul was pursuing him. David had done him no wrong. He had slain Goliath and so there was some popularity accruing to David because of that and Saul became jealous and began to pursue David and so uh, this rises out of a time of great distress and so crying out to God uh, to, for deliverance, have mercy on me, O God. And yet there is a steadfast heart. My heart is steadfast, O God. And so he awakens the dawn with song, with prayer, uh, much the same way Jesus did. Jesus got up early before it was day, daylight and he went out and sought the Father's face in prayer. And so morning prayer has been uh, the practice for many uh, through the centuries, many Christians through the centuries, and I encourage uh, the same uh, before the day gets going and responsibilities and activities unfold. And so uh, reading the psalm with you is, is a portion of, of that practice uh, in my own life. And so David, <coughs> uh, facing uh, these challenges, prays, he sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. And so we've been talking about salvation. God sending from heaven and saving us, as it were, the, 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 the enemy that pursues us. Not an external enemy, but an internal enemy. Sin and death that, that results from that. And so with that uh, psalm uh, in the back. Ground, uh, lifting our hearts, steadfast hearts, to God in prayer. So I'd like to begin Theology 203, continuing to think about salvation. Two weeks ago, what it is and isn't. Last week, the cross of Jesus and how God accomplishes our salvation 
through the cross of Jesus. Now I want to talk about living the saved life or what I'm going to call the cross-shaped life. I want to try to explain that today by way of introduction. And so, uh, a couple weeks ago, when we were talking what salvation is and isn't, towards the end of that study, said that salvation has three tenses to it. Past, present, future. Past tense, we have been saved or justified. And that's, we, we looked at that last week. Uh, I think it was Thursday of last week, Romans 3, 25. We have been justified, that is made right with God. We've been brought back into alignment through the death of Jesus Christ. The innocence or the righteousness of the innocent substitute is transferred to the worshiper, to the person uh, who, who believes, has faith in Jesus Christ. In the Old Covenant, it was symbolized by the priest laying his hand on the head of the scapegoat and driving it away. A transferal of guilt from the, the individual and then the community to the substitute who then bears that away. And so we have been justified. We've been made just or made right. So that's in the past. At the cross, uh, we have been saved. Then we talked about we are being saved. That is, we are being sanctified. To, to be sanctified is to be, really, to be made a saint. <laughs> We're being sanctified. That is, we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. We are being made into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And so this speaks to the present reality of salvation, living the saved life. Letting God's salvation, the rescue and the remedy, the cure, uh, making us whole again. So rescued us from our enemy and, and restoring us uh, to relationship. Letting that work out into our lives on earth as it is in heaven. And so that's what I want to talk about this week. We are being saved. And so what does it mean to live the saved life? If we are a rescued people, if we are a, a restored people, a healed and redeemed people, what does that look like in our lives? Again, I've, I've argued we cannot think of salvation as a ticket that we put in our back pocket. I prayed the sinner's prayer. I walked the sawdust trail uh, at the revival meeting. I can live any old way I want. All I got to do is show my ticket uh, when I get to the pearly gates, and that is not salvation, okay? That, that is the wrong way. That, that's what salvation isn't. And so, what does it mean to live the saved life, okay? What I would like to um, offer this week is a notion that the Christian life, the saved life, is a cruciform or cross-shaped life. Cruciform means the form of the cross. And so uh, many of the ancient, well, the ancient cathedrals uh, that are built, and perhaps modern cathedrals, are built in the shape of a cross. And so there's a long, narrow, you, look, you know, you walk into the cathedral and you look down and it's very long and narrow. And then as you get closer, you notice that there's a couple wings to it. And so folks can sit over here and over here. And what that is, if you look from above, bird's eye view, that's the shape of a cross. And so architecture, the very architecture of the cathedral, is, is cruciform, okay? And so there, there's that a pattern, the cross shape architecture is communicating. So the building itself helps to preach the gospel that we are a saved people. That, that, that the cross stands at the center of uh, how we came to be the people of God, the new covenant people of God. And so I would offer to you that the, the Christian life is a cross-shaped life. Now, that's going to sound kind of strange because that sounds more like an architectural feature, okay? Uh, in Matthew chapter 16, just after uh, Peter confesses um, Jesus as the Christ, uh, Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake 
will find it. And so the call to take up one's cross, if you want to be the follower of Jesus, then it, it requires something. It's the faith in Jesus, and so that's what saves, the faith in his blood, that's what justifies us. But then he calls us to live into that, okay? And so there's this call to come and follow. And so uh, in Galatians, um, one of the New Testament letters, Paul writes this, I, I, I quoted this uh, last week, and I said I'm going to begin with this on Monday. And so Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so on Saturday, just a couple of days ago, reflected on the cross as the demonstration of God's love. We live now for Jesus Christ towards Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ then lives in us. And so the same life that Christ was living, uh, not my will, but thy will be done, now comes to be in us through the power of his spirit. And we're going to talk more about that in a couple weeks, okay? And so this life I now live in the flesh, this, this body that I have, the life I now live I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ. This whole transfer, this substitute. And so Christ dies in our place, in our stead as a substitute. But in a sense then you can say, and this is the insight of the Apostle Paul here and elsewhere, but we were crucified with Christ. Because he died on our behalf, we died with him. There is this... So the, the representative, as it were, acts on behalf of the whole, on, of the community. And so this connection between Jesus Christ and ourselves, so we died with Christ, we were buried with Christ, we are raised with Christ. That's uh, Romans chapter 6. And so baptism signifies that. Kind of the, the picture of being baptized by immersion. You're buried and then you rise. And so as Christ died and rose, so we die and rise with him. And so we now begin to live a new life. And it is a crucified life. I was crucified with Christ. And so if I'm going to live for him, with him, live hit him in me, then it's going to be that kind of life. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, I cited this last night at our Vespers um, gathering. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Lutheran pastor, uh, quite young, uh, during uh, the rise of Hitler and the Nazi uh, party uh, in Germany, and uh, Bonhoeffer was shepherding a flock in a time of great distress. And uh, prior to that, um, the actual encounter with the Nazis, he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship because it was becoming more costly to follow Jesus Christ as the German church, the state church, was going over and they were selling out to the Nazi party. And so he became part of the confessing church that was resisting that. And we're not going to let the political party, we're not going to let the state dictate what happens in the church. Uh, very significant, perhaps for our own day. And so in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, which is an extended reflection on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he writes this. I, I've, I've cited one line. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Let me read the, the fuller section. The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering which every man must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give our we give over our lives to death. 
Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. It may be a death like that of the first disciples who had to leave home and work to follow him, or it may be a death like Luther's who had to leave the monastery and go out into the world, but it is the same death every time. Death in Jesus Christ, the death of the old man at his call. It's a pretty heady little passage there, a piece of writing. The idea is, so, so Bonhoeffer understands, he, he, he reads the scripture. It's in your Bible too, you can read Matthew 16. If any want to be my follower, you must take up your cross and follow me. You must die to ourselves, okay? And so the Christian life is a cross-shaped or a cruciform life. My guess is that some of you are hearing that, that word cruciform perhaps for the first time. And this notion of the Christian life as a cross-shaped life. I thought the Christian life was a victorious life. It was a joyful life. It was a happy life. It's a problem-free life. Eventually, <laughs> eventually when we get on the other side, when we uh, will be saved and glorified on the other side, past, present, future, but in the present, there is this process of engaging Jesus Christ and living for Christ and what he calls us to, the life of faith is a call to follow. And if we're going to follow Jesus, then we're going to follow him as he leads. And his leading is always through the cross. It's unavoidable. And that's what we're going to do this week. I'm going to just show passage after passage after passage uh, in the New Covenant, in the New Testament. And it's like, oh my goodness. The cross isn't just about, oh... Jesus died on the cross to save me from my sin. I'm now free to live how I want and be happy and joyful and God gives me all kinds of goodies. No. That cross shapes the entire experience of the Christian. And so, elements of a cruciform or cross-shaped life that we'll begin to explore this week. Okay. It is the suppression or denial of self-interest. Okay, now this is where we go back to our theology, was it 102, I think it was. This reality, that would be theology 103. What is man that you are mindful of him? Made in God's image, all this glorious uh, bounty and abundance of gifts and capacities, the, the way God's made us, but the fall. In the fall, there is this autonomous reality. We want to become a law unto ourselves. And so self becomes, self-interest becomes central to us. And so we, we kind of enthrone ourselves in our own little kingdom and we want the world to go the way we want. And when it doesn't, we become a little tyrannical, many of us. And so we get petulant and we're upset at others because they're not doing what we want and we're kind of king or queen of our own little kingdom here. And the world is to do what we want. And so to follow Christ then, we have to die to that. Because the, the salvation life, the saved life, is really all about reversing what happened in the garden. That's why that's so essential to understand, oh, this thing is in me too. <laughs> And so the avoidance of responsibility is usually when we, when we blame others and make excuses and point the finger and play the victim, we're usually trying to protect ourselves. Our pride gets wounded, our ego gets wounded and bruised, we take offense, and so we, we blame others lest, because we don't like that painful feeling that we've done wrong, the hot flush of our neck and our blushing when we realize we've done something wrong. Sometimes that's too painful for us to bear. See, so there's a death involved there. And so we need to die to that. And of course, we can do that freely now because that's been, that's been named, that's been, the, the, the reality of that has been taken care of and addressed at the cross. So we can now live freely into this life of self-denial, uh, of, of suppressing or denying self-interest. And so we'll, we'll explore some passages around that. So one element is we die to ourselves, okay? 
And so there's that. A surrender of control and power over others. And so, again, going back to the, the need of our lives, uh, the, the, the problem, the infection, is that we want to be in control. We want to tell others what to do. We think we know what's best for them. Uh, n never mind, we can't hardly even put our own lives together, but we somehow know what's best for other people. And so one of these subtle expressions of sin in our lives is this desire for control and power over others. Uh, Jesus said it this way, um, I think in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, as he's moving towards the cross, he's teaching his followers. Um, and a couple of them want to sit on, hey, when we come into the kingdom, Jesus, can I sit on your right and, and sit, my brother sit on your left? And he said, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and they exercise control over them but it shall not be so among you. Whoever wishes to be first must be last. Whoever, uh, 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 you, you must become the servant uh, of, of all. And so, and so it's this notion of surrendering the desire for control and power over others. And that, friends, is really hard to do. But when Jesus stretches out his hands on the cross, it's an open-handed life. That, that's kind of a picture there. As he, as he stretches out, he has nothing. He has no power. He has surrendered to the power, <laughs> the, the power of the Roman Empire, of the power of the Jewish religious leaders. Now, it took tremendous exercise of strength on Jesus' part, strength of character, to surrender to that. He said, so you're gonna, some of you are thinking right now, well, you want people just trample all over me and walk all over me, and you want the government to tell me what to do? We're going to explore that, okay? We're going to explore that reality. But what I can tell you is Jesus says, you, we have to give up this desire to control other people. That is coming from that place of brokenness. It's coming from the place of sin where we, again, wish to be king or queen of the world and everybody does what we want. And so the surrendered life, okay? And so there's a surrendering of a desire for control and power over others. And this is really hard, um, but this is really important, um, really central. The cruciform life also is marked by a willingness to bear suffering and offense and injustice, okay? Jesus didn't do anything wrong. We know that, right? <laughs> uh, he he um, offended them <laughs> by his calm confidence and teaching, by his healing, by his refusal to... Um, uh, bow to everything they, the, the Pharisees wanted. Um, he, he threatened them, and they were offended by him. And so this becomes a feature of the human family. The feature of our lives is we easily get offended, we easily get insulted, we feel um, this is unjust. Uh, you know, somebody's doing something that doesn't, take account of my feelings or my desires. And frankly, sometimes it is true. There is genuine unjust suffering. People accuse you of things you've never done. Most of the time, though, frankly, it's our pride that's wounded. Again, that, 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 that victim um, tendency gets activated. And, but, and we feel offended. And there's a, there's a sense of suffering that comes with it. Now, there is... There is genuine suffering that we go through. And I don't mean the suffering in our bodies, just, you know, physical suffering of pain. That, that's part of the human experience. I'm talking about the reality of somebody accuses you of something or talks about you or uh, oh, oh, doesn't invite you to the event and, and forgets about that or doesn't return the phone call in a time. Whatever it is that you find, where you find those slights and when it actually does happen, things Somebody actually has it out for you, because that does happen in life. 
the cruciform life, the cross-shaped life, Jesus was willing to bear an unjust suffering. He was willing to bear the offense at the hands of the Jewish religious leaders, at the hands of Pilate and the Roman Empire. And so, again, we're going we're gonna to study each of these. We're going to kind of unpack these as the week goes on here. Really hard to do, okay? <laughs> a willingness to bear suffering and to bear it well without, without a complaint, okay? Jesus, uh, like a lamb before his shears was dumb or mute, didn't say anything. Jesus just took it. And he just cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Those seven last words from the cross. And so the cruciform or cross-shaped life of the Christian, the Christian life, we are called to bear with unjust suffering, to bear with offense and insults, and to bear it well, to bear it nobly, to bear it as Christ did. And so to bear it in Christ. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. Finally, and again, this is not exhaustive, but this is, these are elements of the, the cruciform or, or cross-shaped life. A refusing to retaliate and a trusting that God's going to make it right. So this kind of ties together. Typically what we do when, when we are offended, when we feel some injustice has, has taken place, uh, you know, we complain or we retaliate or we want revenge. Um, much of our world right now has gone mad with the social media and so there's all of these, somebody posts something and they're offended by it and they post something back and then this person, you know, and there's this kind of a thermonuclear war that happens online. And, but people's lives and, and, and livelihoods and reputations are being really ruined in this. It's interesting. And sadly, Christians get involved in this. That we need to stand up for ourselves and we need to, we need to you know, fight back. That is, not the, that is not the Christian life. Fighting back is not the Christian life. And some of you are going to take some offense at what I just said. And we're going to explore that, okay? I didn't say it's not courageous. I didn't say we don't stand. Uh, but it's not fighting back. Peter, you know, when they came to arrest Jesus, took out a sword and slop, you know, lopped off the ear of uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, guards who came, um, maybe the servant of, of one of the guards who came, and Jesus said, put away the sword. Okay, The Christian life is not a fighting back against somebody who, who offends me or offends us. Okay, I'm not talking about United States of America and there are enemies of the state and the, the state has the sword as the scriptures write. So I'm not talking about that. I am not talking about civil realities. I'm talking about discipleship and following Jesus Christ and living a saved life as a follower of Jesus. You as an individual, not our nation. Okay, those are two completely separate realities that we often conflate and, and we try to merge our Christianity and our patriotism in such a way that then we feel justified <clears throat> in our arming ourselves and fighting back as a Christian. And I, I, so we'll have to talk long about that uh, as we get going. If that's your view and, and you're feeling yourself a little stirred up right now, I'm just going to bid you uh, listen first, push back, fight with me later, okay? And so a refusing to retaliate and importantly in tr trusting ourselves that God's going to make it right. God will vindicate. God will avenge. And so we do not take those matters into our own hands. And so these are elements. These are not an exhaustive list, but these are elements of a cross-shaped life. Each of them, as you will notice, involves a death. <laughs> Dying to self and self-interest, what I want, when I want, where I want. Dying to a desire to get what I want in the relationships I have with other people, so uh, control uh, and power over others. Uh, a dying uh, to uh, offense and, and insult and, 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 and wounded pride. Um, and a dying to think that I should have a comfortable life all the time. 
and then a dying to a desire to seek vengeance and retaliation on my own. And friends, let me tell you, every one of these is hard. The cross is hard. <laughs> the cross is hard to bear. The Christian life is strenuous. It is a strenuous life. And so many people do not understand this. Some of you may be hearing this for the very first time. And I'm embarrassed that I've been your pastor for 19 years and if I haven't made this clear, okay? So I apologize that I haven't lifted this up more centrally. Um, but if we're going to live as a saved people, then we're going to take our cross, we're going to understand we've been crucified with Christ, and then that has implications in our lives, which we're going to explore together this week. So, how about that for a Monday morning, huh? <laughs> and so, uh, we begin another week of studies together. Uh, I do invite your prayers uh, as we engage in this study. Uh, and uh, pray for one another. Uh, the, the small community of folks who are watching these, listening these. Um, uh, again, if you're, you're watching to the end, I've gotten some emails. Um, uh, there's a discussion group that has begun on Wednesday afternoons. Um, we call it the Bitter Enders. And, um, uh, you know, those who watch to the bitter end of these things, it's kind of uh, tongue-in-cheek. But we basically have about an hour, hour and a half discussion on the topics of the week. And it's, it's a very robust and delightful group. Uh, and so would love to invite you, if you watch to this point, uh, would love to invite you uh, to engage in this conversation as well. Let's take a moment to pray. And so Lord, as we begin a new week, we offer our thanks to you for your love and faithfulness. We offer our thanks to you uh, for your sacrifice on our behalf and the transfer of your innocence and righteousness to our lives so that the Father now sees us as he sees his own Son. And so, in response to that, you call us to take up our cross, to follow, to die. And Lord, we're just going to acknowledge it's really hard to do that. And we don't even know what it all means. Uh, and it hurts, and it's frustrating, and it's difficult. And we want to give up. And so we're going to pray. We are praying for the power of your Holy Spirit to be released in new and fresh measure. As we study this week to open our minds and our understanding to your truth. And then that which is true will remain and abide in our hearts. That which is not true or helpful, Lord, you will blow away with the wind of the same Spirit. And so for those who mourn this day, those in need of healing and strength this day, those who go forth to protect and defend and to serve in our communities to keep us healthy and safe, we pray today. For our church and our sister churches and our mission partners near and far, we pray today. And in our own lives and in our own homes, Lord, help us to live as the followers of Jesus, in whose name we pray and who taught us to pray together, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. May the God who demonstrated his great love for you by sending his son Jesus to die on the cross and then that Jesus calling you to come have deep and intimate fellowship with him. May that God, may that Jesus, may that spirit bless you and keep you this day and forevermore. Amen.